Hello, I'm Raymond, uh, this is Chris, and welcome to the show. We're here today with uh, Professor Pete Lund to discuss decision-making and behavioral sciences under COVID-19. Pete Lund is the founder and the head of the ESRI Behavioral Research Unit. He's a jack of all trades in the decision-making field, holding degrees from philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, and economics. His work on behavioral science and policy development has spanned from economic decision-making to environmental and health policies. He's also the best-selling author of a popular behavioral science book, Basic Instincts, Human Nature and the New Economics, and a regular contributor for the radio show News Talk on behavioral economics as well as an ex-BBC journalist. Pete, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. You're very welcome. So I know that you've had degrees in philosophy, psychology, neuroscience and economics. How has that helped your work and how did you end up uh, actually doing behavioral science research? So, I mean, it helps my work hugely. Uh, I consider myself these days, I describe myself as an applied behavioral scientist. And what I mean by that is I use, I call myself a behavioral scientist because I use ideas not only from economics and psychology, but also some ideas from sociology and uh, beyond. Um, applied because everything that we do in the behavioral research unit here in Dublin is done for policy. We do research that is for policymakers and the questions that we ask, the research questions we tackle for policy. And I think having the kind of broad background in multiple disciplines that I have is really, really helpful, partly because it gives you multiple perspectives. And if you need to apply science to policy, I think you really need that. A bit of grounding in philosophy of science is really helpful. Uh, experimental psychology is really helpful because it's a very inductive form of science. It starts very much from the premise that we don't know and we need to experiment to find out. Um, so, of course, there's lots of theory in psychology, but experimental psychology has really, I think, uh, made a name for itself and been successful partly through designing clever and insightful experiments that give us insights into the way that people think and behave and act. And I think that's really useful. On the other hand, I think economics is also very, very useful uh, because it gives you a theoretical framework within which to think, but also without meaning to be in any way rude to psychologists, which was my original uh, the rigor. There's a mathematical rigor about the way economists approach data and mathematical modeling, which I think when combined with psychology makes the science that we do stronger. So my team is a mixture of economists and psychologists, and actually in the office I make sure that they don't quite sit alternately, but every economist is close to a psychologist and every psychologist is close to an economist because it's the fertile overlap between the disciplines that really helps us to do our work. And because I have degrees in both, I mean, I, I find that I draw from both all the time. So for someone who's not particularly um, familiar with the field, can you explain to me what behavioural science actually is? Behavioural science is a broad umbrella term that covers multiple scientific sub-disciplines that are essentially attempting to explain, predict, and sometimes change human behavior. Um, so you get people who call themselves behavioral scientists or economists. I, these days, I'm really a behavioral economist, although my first degree is in psychology. But as I said, I call myself an applied behavioral scientist. Uh, you get people in psychology who call themselves behavioral scientists, people in anthropology, in sociology, social psychologists, many of them will do it. If I'm honest, I mean, behavioral science is a larger umbrella term, but what it really is, is the rebranding of psychology. I mean, the economists who call themselves behavioral scientists are the ones who take psychology more seriously in trying to tackle economic analysis. And I think behavioral science is really the rebranding of psychology. Um, I think that's needed because psychologists are not taken seriously enough by decision makers and policy makers. If you go to a politician and you say, I'm a psychologist, and they think that means you're making some claim that you understand people, well, they've gone to the trouble of being elected. Politicians and people who are in public affairs like to think they understand people pretty well. So you start with a credibility problem if you describe yourself as a psychologist. If you describe yourself as a behavioral scientist, well, you've used the S word, which is scary for all people in public life who are not scientists, so they take you much more seriously. Um, so I find the term behavioral scientist is extremely useful. It's primarily a rebranding. I mean, it's just an umbrella term for multiple disciplines of people who are using the scientific method to understand human behavior. And that's why it's a successful term, I think. So what role does behavioral science play in understanding the global COVID situation? So at its most straightforward, behavioral science is really important for understanding what's happening because whether people get infected 
depends upon their behavior. So if we understand people's behavior better, then we can understand ways to reduce the probability of infection. So that's obviously really important. And there are live debates all over the world about compliance and how we might shape things to allow people to comply better with restrictions that are going to reduce infection. So clearly, behavioral science has a big role to play there. It also has a role, though, to play in coping with the crisis. We're all living under restrictions that are having a large effect on people's psychological well-being. So here in Ireland, we've measured that. We use a standard technique, and a group at University College Dublin here has done this. So we use a standard technique for measuring people's well-being, which is called the day reconstruction method, where we take them back through the episodes of yesterday, and we ask them how they were feeling at each time. We ask uh, what psychologists call for affect measures, in other words, people's emotional feelings during the period during the episodes of yesterday, if we do that and measure people's well-being, roughly speaking, compared to normal times, on average, the Irish population has all been simultaneously made unemployed, if you look at their well-being. The well-being hit the low mood and greater feelings of sadness in the population are the equivalent of everybody having been made simultaneously unemployed. So behavioral science has a big role to play in measuring that, trying to give people coping strategies, trying to get people to feel better about the situation they find themselves in, as well as the core thing, which is trying to reduce infection by getting people to behave in manners that reduce the chances we transmit this nasty disease to each other. So I know that you've recently published a massive review of looking at more than 100 papers on how behavioral sciences can uh, contribute to fighting the coronavirus. You've talked about how they can contribute to tackling social isolation, increasing hand washing and face touching, and um, effective crisis communication as a leader in describing risk. What did you find? So there's a lot in there, but the things that I would really highlight would be these. There are simple ways you can design the social and physical environment that will improve people's hand hygiene. So let me give you the most straightforward example I can think of. There is clear evidence that if you design the physical and social environment right, you can improve people's hand hygiene. So if you, if you run a business or if you're running any kind of public building, if you put hand sanitation stations, so this is like a station with a sign and hand sanitizers, directly beyond the door, so that it's not attached to the wall, I don't have to look for it. If I come through that door, I'd have to go, well, where's the hand sanitizer? What would actually happen is if I didn't think about hand sanitation, I would trip over it. Right? It is in my way. I would have to actively avoid it and go around it. If you do that, more people use the hand sanitizer when they enter a building. OK, um, so a nice salient sign, put it in people's way. If I then go up to the reception in the building and the receptionist says to me, oh, did you use the hand sanitizer? We then also have the social environment right, which is if I don't do what I'm supposed to do and what everyone's expecting me to do and what I've already not done in a public space, I then get on the end of a little bit of social disapproval as well. And one of the things we know is that a little bit of social disapproval for these kind of collective action problems where all of our chances of getting this disease depends on the behavior of all of the rest of us. We've all got to make these little sacrifices in our lives to help everyone else. We know a bit of social disapproval is very important to getting people to comply. So a behavioral scientist would say, look, there are simple things we can do like that. That's cheap. It's easy to do that will have a significant chance of improving hand hygiene and decreasing the chances that people contract the disease. So that's a good example of a kind of behavioral design idea. However, what else is in the review that I think is really important is this business of how do we solve collective action problems. So what we are asking people to do at the moment is to maintain social distancing, to improve their hand hygiene, to abide by the various rules that government are putting in place some of which they'll understand well, as others of which they won't understand so well, but the various rules that the public health people have put in place say, this will slow the transmission of the disease. We're requiring everybody to do this, everyone to make sacrifices for the common good. Now, these kind of problems are problems that behavioral scientists have understood now for 30 or 40 years. And we know that people will make sacrifices for the common good. The overwhelming majority will do that, but the chances that they do it are much higher. It depends on the circumstances. One of the bits of good news is that when there's a crisis, people actually become more likely to pull together and engage in common activity that's for mutual benefit. They're actually better at it during crisis periods. It's remarkable how humans pull together and do this. So that's helpful. But there are other things we know, too, from the science of this. One is that communication is vital. 
In order to get that collective action that's good for everybody, with everyone making these sacrifices, everyone has to understand why the behavior that's being asked of them is best for all. And if that is communicated often and clearly, so look, everyone's doing this, we've all got to do this, because if we all do this, this is the outcome for society. If people understand the logic of that and it's communicated why the behavior is best for all, you have a much better chance of getting compliance and getting everyone to do what they should do. The other thing we know, again, from decades of research on this, is that the, however strong the group identity is, the more powerful the group identity of the group that's trying to behave in a common way that's best for all, the better chance you have of compliance. And that means there's a really important role for leadership. And that whole message of we are in this together and getting the community to feel like they are at one trying to fight this disease, the better we get that group identity, the more likely it is that everybody complies. That also tells you that if we break this down and make it a political problem, where it's one side of our society against another, it will be much harder to get people to behave as if they have a common purpose to fight this disease. And I think if I'm honest, we can see that the countries that are struggling to deal with this are the ones where this has become a political issue and it's polarised because then you reduce your levels of compliance because you don't have that common group feeling. The final thing I'll say to you, I appreciate this is a pretty long answer to quite a short question, but there's a lot of ways behavioural science can help in this crisis. The other thing I've already mentioned that's worth re-emphasising, there are a section, there are people, there's a section in our society that is more selfish than the rest of us. If you run these kind of collective action problems or common pool resource problems, as we call them, you can study them experimentally, you can study them through field studies. If you do, you find there's a group of people, maybe sort of about one in eight of us, something like It's hard to measure it accurately because too often these studies have been done in student populations and younger people are on average a little more selfish than older people. We become a little more generous and cooperative as we get older. So we may have overestimated the size of it, but somewhere around one in eight people really struggle if you give them one of these social dilemmas where they could behave for the common good or they could behave more selfishly. About one in eight will behave more selfishly, but you can bring them into line by some fairly modest punishment. That punishment can be as little as social disapproval. It can be as little as them worrying about if I don't do what everyone else is going to do, then I'll be thought of badly or people won't like me as much. That can be enough. If it's not enough, then that punishment needs to go further. And even if it's just a police officer tapping you on the shoulder and asking you why you're out and about and what are you doing, that again can be enough that it brings people into line. But we know from these collective action problems that there will be some people who struggle with it, will behave more selfishly, and that the rest of us will have to pick them up on that and try to bring them into line. So I know that the media or um, some people have been saying that with social distancing and social isolation, um, it creates a sort of behavioural fatigue. Could you tell us maybe what this is and is there any evidence at all to support this? Behavioural fatigue appears to have come from a hunch that some behavioural scientists had. I know of no evidence for the concept of behavioural fatigue. And I know that the large majority of behavioural scientists in the UK where this became a big issue and elsewhere also believe there is not evidence for a concept of behavioural fatigue. That doesn't mean there isn't something in the idea. There might be something in the idea. It is just that, as of now, as a behavioural scientist, I know of no evidence for it. Um, now, we have tried here to include ideas of behavioural fatigue in some of the behavioural studies that we are doing on COVID-19 for the Irish government where we are trying to look at people's likelihood of compliance and how acceptable they find some behaviours versus other behaviours. And we framed some of the problems that we've given people in terms of behavioural fatigue. So allow me to give you an answer here, uh, sorry, an example here, where we asked people whether they thought it was acceptable for somebody who was 71 years old, who'd been cocooning for five weeks and hadn't seen any friend, would it be acceptable for them to go out and meet a friend for a takeaway cup of coffee and a walk for half an hour or not. So you see what we've done there is we have built behavioural fatigue into the design of a question to see if you get people to trade off this awful thing of this poor old guy who's been isolated for five weeks 
against a minor violation of the guidelines, does it make a difference if we put the fatigue element into that story? Does it make a difference how acceptable people find it or don't find it? Um, so we've started studying it. We haven't, as of yet, found any evidence that behavioural fatigue is a major problem. That doesn't mean it isn't. It just means there isn't any evidence for it. I think in those circumstances, what that means is, from a policy point of view, uh, you are taking a big risk if you factor behavioural fatigue into a major policy question, given we really don't have, have, have any evidence for it. And that's actually something I wanted to move on to, which is um, scientific research during um, COVID-19. How trustworthy is it? So I know that, um, for example, ethics and uh, the publications are approved really quickly because of the need to study COVID-19. And um, does this actually link into, for example, open science or like replication of studies in um, psychology or behavioral sciences? That's an extremely good question. So we have now just completed our third study. After doing that review paper, we've now run three experimental studies um, as a team. Uh, there's eight of us. We would normally run one of these studies over about three to four months where maybe three or four members of the team were contributing. Instead, we're turning them around about one every 10 to 12 days with all members of the team working on it. So you can do the maths on that. You can see that what that means is we are operating much more quickly and clearly we cannot be quite as rigorous as we normally would be. So let me give you an example there. When I an experimental study in my lab, what we normally do is two people analyze data. So they analyze it completely independently and I'd have two people do it. It's usually me and somebody else. Um, we might even use a different software package. Right? But we would certainly write different syntax and analyze the data using two different approaches and then compare what we get to make sure we get the same. During this crisis, there's not time to do that. So the way I've tended to do it is I've analyzed the data and then one or two members of my team have gone line by line through my code looking for mistakes and I have given them the job of trying to find errors. So. You try to build in what you can, but you've got to cut some corners because you're being asked to go as quickly as possible. So you try to devise systems that allow you to do that. Uh, that said, we have pre-registered all three of the studies. There is nothing to stop you pre-registering your hypotheses and analysis plans because, frankly, for any experiment, I think it usually takes less than an hour to write a pre-registration document. And I think that's an important part of modern open science practice. So we've carried on doing that, even though we're turning studies around in about 10 days. That's absolutely great to hear. Um, so if we move on to um, looking at, for example, maybe in the community response to COVID-19, um, I was thinking, how would you actually unite a massive community? So if it's, for example, the UK and the Ireland, the population is relatively small compared to if it's in uh, India or the US, it, there might be other problems, like as you said, political problems or like religious problems that might affect it. But it seems like the, the bigger the country, the harder it is to develop sort of an intervention uh, to tackling COVID-19. Do you think that might be true? Uh, I would suspect that that's right. Um, so I've lived in Ireland now for nearly 20 years. I'm originally English. I've lived in Ireland now for nearly 20 years. Ireland is a more cohesive society and a much smaller one than the UK. So we have a population that's approximately 10% of the UK population. Um, I think it's been easier for us to solve some of the collective action problems. I mean, sure, we have problems of non-compliance. We have some difficulties, but I think we've been more successful in getting the population to buy into a common strategy than the UK has been. And I think as you go to bigger countries still, it becomes more and more difficult. I think that observation is probably right. Um, there's something very interesting, actually, that's a parallel to some of the work that's been done on well-being generally, which is to say that people who live in smaller countries tend to have a slightly stronger sense of cohesion, which contributes to their psychological well-being. There's even a hint that it might be that being in a smaller country next to a larger country is quite helpful. So uh, Denmark, Canada, Ireland are all countries that seem to have this kind of stronger cohesion and slightly higher well-being as a result. Um, so there are some compensations for living next to a more powerful neighbour that's given you trouble throughout the centuries. Um, anyway, d d despite all of this, I mean, I think the question that you've asked is a really good one about how you get that cohesion. 
Um, I mean, just one simple example, we really still as a country, because we're less than five million people, we still as a country have one really dominant television news program. And I think that's really helpful in a crisis like this, that we don't have different subsections of the population listening to different media that have different positions and philosophies and so on. So I think that kind of coherence in a smaller country is definitely easier to come by, yes. Um, so we've touched on this um, before um, about social norms. We know that from Ash's study and from other conformity studies that people are uncomfortable departing from the norm, especially under uncertainty. So the, the question is, how, how can we actually construct a norm, that, a social norm that under COVID-19 that can, for example, help us reduce the spread of the virus in a community? That's an extremely good question. Uh, behavioural scientists spend a lot of time trying to work out how to make positive social norms spread, and it's not very easy because if you do it in an unsubtle, top-down way, quite often people react against the authority that's trying to get them to behave in a particular way. The strongest social norms are those that arise organically. One of the things that's really difficult in this crisis is that the norms you're trying to support aren't visible. So the people who are complying and are staying at home and are engaging in good hand hygiene and staying at home, uh, well, nobody else in society can see that. The people we can see are the people who are out and about and are not complying. The result of this is, and we can see this in our data, is that people are consistently overestimating non-compliance because non-compliance is what they can see. and It starts to look like a norm that's spreading through society because when they go out, that's what they see. And we can't see it. This My entire street here is a street of terraced houses where I bet there are loads of people behaving exactly as my family are behaving, staying at home, getting their lunch together and washing their hands more often than they normally do. But, we, you know, it's, it's not available. So it's an extremely difficult problem. What it does mean is there's a real role for leadership and for good behaviour by the media. Um, if the media only highlight non-compliance, they're not helping us at all. It's really important to report this story properly, that they also report what's going on with people who are complying and examples of how people are doing that creatively and well. That's an important part of the media's responsibility in a crisis, I think. But it also, and I speak partly as an ex-journalist there, I, mean, I spent 10 years as a journalist. I mean, journalists have to ask difficult questions. They have to hold people to account. But at times like this, they have to understand as well that sending information faithfully is really, really important. And one of the important bits of information here is to get across how people's behaviour has changed for the better, as well as where there are examples of it fraying at the edges. But the other thing I was going to say to you is this, that it's a really important role for leadership. Um, if we want to encourage those social norms, we have to have leaders that we are uh, that we have faith in, that are credible, that are not talking down to us, that are not talking in a kind of punitive authoritarian way, but are talking in an empathetic way that understand what it is that we are going through and can encourage that in a very genuine way. Um, and I think we know from trying to solve collective action problems where you put in place the difficulty of communication and leadership as part of the collective action problem that it turns out to be really important. Good leaders and good leadership is one of the vital things in establishing norms that people are willing to follow. And what's your um, opinion on the leadership so far shown in uh, the UK? It's difficult for me because I'm not UK based anymore. I mean, I'm from the UK, but I'm not UK based anymore. Um, I think, if I'm honest, I think the UK probably made a mistake in going for restrictive measures later than most other countries. Uh, I'm afraid, I don't know for certain, but I'm afraid that might partly have been because they got advice from some behavioural scientists that I don't think was strong advice. Um, and I think that's a pity. Um, I nevertheless think that the level of compliance in the UK, well, probably not as good as it is in Ireland and perhaps not as good as some other European countries, has still been pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, if you ask most people, would society be capable of responding in the way that it's responded two or three months ago? I think most of them would probably have said no, that it is not possible to get a coordinated mass response from people in the way that there has been. And I think in that sense, it's impressive. One of the funny things, actually, being a behavioural scientist at a time like this, is that you can, as we did, you can delve into the literature and the research which will tell you that people really pull together and can behave in remarkable ways as a collective group in response to crisis. You read that and then you look at the crisis you're facing and you think, Jesus, can we really do this? Really? 
And then you actually see it happen and you think, wow, yes, actually we can. Those studies are right. That is what people do. But even though I know that from a scientific point of view and I know there's evidence for that, intuitively I'm still amazed at how good we are at it. And I think it doesn't pay to lose sight of that. We see some non-compliance. We see some countries that are doing it better than other countries. But the overwhelming story here actually is one of a remarkable degree of behavior change where we have coordinated ourselves well enough that the vast majority of people have acted in ways that have greatly reduced the infection. And that's an amazing thing to watch in many ways. Moving on from that, is there any anything that you think the media could improve on in the communication of the situation to the public, both in Ireland and the UK? Uh, yes. So I, there are two things about uh, the media response that I, th I think are important. I mean, and I should be careful here again, because much of the media reporting has been really good. And I've seen some really good stuff that's very encouraging and that is spreading good ideas and is helping people to cope. And that's one of the media's roles in all of this. However, having said that, there's a couple of things, really. Uh, one, I think, is that there has been too much focus on non-compliance because it's visible and it causes outrage and it makes for a good story. And I think the result of that is that we are overestimating the degree of non-compliance in society pretty consistently. We can see that in our own data. We've got data from multiple surveys, behavioral experiments, focus groups, uh, observational data. Uh, actually, the overwhelmingly, people are complying really well. But when we survey people, everyone thinks everyone else isn't complying so well. Um, so the population as a whole is underestimating the degree of com compliance of other people. And I think that's partly due to the way it's being reported, as well as this problem of what they see when they go out and about, because all you can see is non-compliance for the most part. So uh, that's there. The really big one, though, is this, for me, that there is a misperception at the moment, and it's a really important misperception. And that misperception is that there is some clamour for these restrictions to be lifted. And actually... The behavioural evidence that we are seeing, and not just in Ireland, but in other countries, including the UK, is that there is a very substantial amount of nervousness associated with the lifting of restrictions. And that actually most of the population want it to go slowly and very carefully, gradually, and be, and be monitored. They recognise there is a trade-off between getting their freedoms back and the danger of a second rush of infections and a danger of more deaths. And we can see that in all the data, but the way that is currently being reported is that everyone is dying for these restrictions to be lifted and to get back out there. And it simply isn't true. And when you measure it properly, that perspective is just not right. There is a silent majority, a phrase I never thought I would hear myself utter, but there is a silent majority here that is viewing the world in a much more cautious and sensible way. Um, and policy needs to be made for those people, but the media needs to report that that is the case and not reports suggesting that everyone can't wait to dive back out onto the streets because it simply isn't true. So going back to your figure um, you mentioned earlier where you said one in one in eight people maybe aren't compliant. Um, what, why do you think this is and to what extent do you think those sort of people should be socially policed? So we need to be careful here. It's not that one in eight are not complying. What it is is that if you put people in social dilemmas, so this is like 30 or 40 years of science, really, where we have placed people in social dilemmas. Uh, behavioral economists call these things public goods games, where you can contribute to a common pot that is increased and split among everybody. So the socially best thing to do is for everyone to contribute so everyone gets the benefit. Or you can be selfish and keep your contribution back and free ride on other people's contribution. So you can put people in these places of social dilemmas where they have to uh, decide whether to do the thing that is selfish and is in their interest or to do the thing that if everybody does it is better for everybody, right? And we've studied these things for 30, 40 years. We know that around one in eight people struggle with these circumstances, that they will not behave for the common good. They will be more likely to behave selfishly. So that doesn't mean one in eight people in this crisis aren't complying. It just means that we know that tendency is there. We also know that in those circumstances, if the majority who want to do the socially best thing have the ability to punish those that are not the free riders, those that are not going to contribute, that it brings a lot of the free riders into line. And the punishment doesn't have to be strong. It doesn't have to be a financial penalty or some kind of overt punishment, although it can be and that can help. Even social disapproval is often enough 
to make people go along with what's socially best and to override their own struggles to overcome their selfishness. And we just know that that one in eight is about that. So what that means is, yeah, there does need to be some policing, even if it's just social policing, even if it's just picking our friends up at the edges where we're saying, hang on a minute, you know, you shouldn't really be doing that. Those kind of social interventions actually are really important to get the coordination. And of course, at the more extreme end, I mean, you know, if people are heading to the park with a bottle of cider um, and drinking with seven or eight friends and keeping no social distance, I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I would fully support the police service in picking them up and, you know, bringing them to book because at the one end, you know, there is flagrant violation that needs to be picked up. So we touched on it a minute ago um, about the restrictions being lifted. So your, I understand your main interest is in economic trade-offs and decision-making. Is there a point where the material impacts of COVID can outweigh the amount of deaths in terms of suffering caused? And how should this consideration be play, play into policy and social distancing? That's an extremely difficult question, but at heart, I am an economist to the point where um, you've got to accept, I think, that that trade-off is there. Um, So there comes a point where the damage that we do to our society and our economy causes as much, if not more, damage as the damage that the disease can be doing. Now, do I think we've got to that point yet? Well, no, but I think it's incredibly difficult to judge. Um, so yes, there is a trade-off there, and how we execute that trade-off is a, a, a difficult question. Um, what we know from the research that we've just done here, actually, is that the public completely gets that trade-off. We've just done an experiment uh, about the exit strategy in Ireland, where we've given people mock scenarios that respond to the different scenarios. Um, and what we find is that the public responds as if it really understands that trade-off go too fast and you risk too many infections and too many deaths, go too slow and you're not making any progress back towards normality, which ultimately we have to because our society and economy is suffering damage as a result of lockdown. So people get the trade-off and that's good. Um, That's helpful from a policy point of view to that, to know that we can communicate to people that they understand it and that the public are largely viewing this crisis through that lens, that they're understanding the trade-off that we all face. In terms of managing it, though, I think the important thing there as well is that it isn't just a question of where one draws the line. It's not just a question of how much do we go towards the economy, how much do we go towards reducing infection. Important in there is management of the process as well. It's what's the review period. It's how we're feeding data back in. It's the system that's there so that we get the feedback on our own behavior well enough to manage the trade-off on the way out. And that's going to be really, really important. So, I mean, the public health people have talked about getting in place the right kind of testing regime and the organization to be able to respond quickly as infections change, as the rate of infections and hospitalizations changes. But there's a psychological element to that as well which is that the public need to be updated as to what's going on, so because you've got to have public buy-in to get the compliance as you ease the restrictions. So that cycle of information and responding, what's our goal? What are we trying to achieve? It's vital if we're in this great big collective action problem and we're trying to get the public to go along with our gradual easing of restrictions, that that feedback includes them, that they can see that every two or three weeks or whatever it is that we're giving them the feeling that this is how we are moving towards our goals for the next stage. This is what we're willing to do. This is why. And so as I had to that review paper and the earlier question about what do you do to try and get people to comply in a collective action problem, everyone has to see why the behavior is best for all. And on the way down, that's a really difficult problem to solve. So how you give the feedback, how you give the targets, how you get the common goal across to the public so that they can trade off risk of infection versus other damage. That's the ball game. That's what's hard. So um, on the note of knowledge, I know that there is research in behavioral sciences suggesting that people are biased to take more risks when they feel more confident. So this seems to be the case in COVID-19 where there are more self and many self-proclaimed experts who've got the information from the university called the internet. Um, should this be of worry? So if I understand correctly, you're referring to Amos Tversky's competence hypothesis. So the basic idea is that people are more willing to take risks when they feel competent about their knowledge. And that is absolutely correct. And what it means is that misinformation during COVID-19 is extremely important. You're absolutely right, because if people feel confident that they know something, but what they know is not correct, 
then you, you are going to get people taking inappropriate risks. And, and what we know is even if we give people guidelines on how to behave, there will be marginal cases, and we've measured this in some of our studies, there will be marginal cases where it's not completely clear whether the behavior is okay or not okay, and you've got to trade off possible infection risk against the benefits of doing something for your kids or doing something for work or whatever it is. People are going to have to negotiate those trade-offs on a daily basis. So it's absolutely vital that they get the right information to feel competent to judge those risks. So yes, you're, you're correct. There is a really important role for public information and giving people the right level of confidence about what they know and what they don't know. And that's difficult. But in crisis communication, we do know some things about that, um, about the importance of the credibility of the messenger, uh, maintaining that credibility, their honesty and transparency. And also we feel more in control. We feel like we have a better handle on the situation when that person is also empathetic. So one thing that's really important is not to rule all of the emotion out of this. There's quite a lot of emotion in it. And understanding how people feel is also a really important part of getting across the collective strategy to them. So some of these people are simply people who, um, for example, read misinformation or just aren't, aren't really sure of what they're reading. But some others um, believe that, for example, coronavirus is a hoax. I think the recent statistic I got was 13% of Americans thought that it was fake and um, it's a scam by the liberal media. So are there any behavioral interventions that you could suggest to change their minds, perhaps? What you raise there is extremely difficult. And behavioral scientists have now been wrestling with this problem of polarization and this problem of what I would describe as extreme beliefs and people's ability to interpret evidence in light of extreme beliefs through, you know, confirmation bias and other biases in the way that people read evidence. People have been struggling with this problem for some time. I think we've made some progress in understanding it. One of the ways we've made progress is that we now know that it isn't just a question of confirmation bias. It isn't just a question of people looking for evidence that supports their beliefs. There's also quite a lot of group identity in it. That what happens here is that people who start to believe conspiracy theories or fake news stories, um, a good examples, here's the work that's been done on the anti-vaccination lobby, for example. It's partly about social connectedness. They're partly getting connectedness with others and making friendships and getting group identity out of belonging to a group that identifies itself in a particular way against the mainstream or around a set of belief systems, which as a scientist, I look at those belief systems and I think they're crazy because I know they're not true. I mean, there are even, as we know, there's a resurgence in flat earthers. Well, flat, why, why is that happening? Well, it's partly because they get a sense of social connectedness from talking to each other and sharing the belief, even if the belief has no factual basis. So we do have a better understanding now from a behavioral point of view of what's driving these problems. So we have a diagnosis. A remedy is a different thing altogether. Um, and it, it's turning out to be an extremely difficult problem. And some of the science is showing that actually hitting them with more science and facts and evidence doesn't seem to help. <laughs> they simply find it easier and easier to rail against it, suggest that it's conspiratorial and get stronger identity out of disbelieving it. So it's a social problem. It's not a scientific communication problem. And actually understanding it as a social problem rather than as a science communication problem is one of the important things we probably need to do. But, I mean, if I could answer your question, Raymond, I would be out there now telling everyone about the answer I had because I don't know how to solve it either. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so moving on to something that we've actually touched on um, earlier about the UK's government's response. Um, as a behavioural economist, do you see not theories actually playing out as a good behavioural intervention in under COVID-19, uh, particularly, for example, in developing countries? And if not, what are the best alternatives do we have? So, nudge theories. I'm not sure nudge is a theory. Um, not in the scientific sense, it's not a theory. Uh, nudging is a particular way of using behavioural science and behavioural economics in policy circles where what you say is the right way to use this science is to not deny people options or force them to do things but to arrange the environment in such a way that you push them in a particular direction so they still have the choice to not do what you want them to do 
But what you're doing is you're changing the environment so they are more likely to do what you want them to do. And you're doing it partly on the basis of the fact that they would think it was better for them too. So this would be the idea of nudging. Notice there that if there's any theory in there, it's a theory from political theory and political science. It's not a scientific theory. Okay, The science is being used to execute a particular way of politically intervening in a policy intervention where you are trying to change somebody's decisions because you judge that those decisions are better for them and better for society. Now, if you look at the example of where you place hand sanitizers and whether the receptionist asks people whether they've used them and that increasing the use of hand sanitation, that's a nudge. Um, as the person coming in, you have the opportunity, if you wish, to not use that hand sanitizer and to say to the receptionist, no, actually, I didn't use the hand sanitizer and I'm not going to. Now, no one's denying you that opportunity, but there's a strong behavioral intervention there that is going to make people more likely to use the hand sanitizer. So that's a nudge. So nudges have their place. Uh, they can be extremely useful. But nudges are only ever one way to use behavioral science. There are many, many other ways. And I think when you're dealing with an unprecedented situation like this, the most important way actually to use behavioral science is in the classic diagnostic sense which is to say people are behaving in a particular way at the moment. Uh, can we understand it? Can we run studies that mean we understand why people are behaving the way they are, why they feel the way they do? Can we run studies that show that we can get their well-being levels back up if we intervene in a particular way? Can we run studies that show that it is easier for people to follow the guidelines if we lay things out in this particular way? Some of the solutions we produce might be nudges, some of them might not. Right. Some of them may be more command and control, where we literally say, look, given what we understand about how you are struggling, we will say that the gui guideline A will be lifted before guideline B, because the behavioral science suggests it will be easier and it will make you feel better. Right Now, that wouldn't be a nudge. That's changing a command and control regulation, depending on what the, the diagnosis and behavioral science is. So, yes, nudges can be helpful, but nudges are only one way to use behavioral science. And I think in a crisis like this, the primary way to use it is to understand how people are behaving so that you can make better policy, whether it's a nudge or not. So looking towards the future, um, we recently in the UK had uh, Chris Whitty, the chief uh, medical officer, come out and say that we might have to keep on social distancing up until maybe up until Christmas. What behavioural science um, techniques do we have that can help um, understand and sort of deal with this situation if social distancing is strung out over a much longer time than we have actually planned? So that's again a very good question and I think what I would say is this goes back to the previous answer about diagnosing the problem correctly. Um, if we're going to have longer term behavioural change that is necessary then a crucial concept here is habit. So it's extremely cognitively effortful uh, to go against your habits. Uh, habits are really efficient and important things. What habits do is they allow us to repeat behaviours so that we can free our brains up to think about the things we really need to think about, looking after our families, doing our work, our friendships and the people we care about and so on. That's what we want to be thinking about. We don't want to be thinking about daily habits. So we have these, these things where we just do these behaviours automatically. Um, now, of course, new habits are already starting to form. I mean, you can see that in the way people no longer have to stop themselves shaking hands when they meet a friend out on their daily walk or whatever. You'll actually see that their immediate response is to go, oh, and back off a little bit. because they. So you can already see habits are changing. But what we've got to do is we've got to try and help people to do it by making things as easy for them as possible so that behaviours that are reducing the probability of infection become habitual. Now, that is partly how we lay the environment out. So if people are going to go back to work, even if it's maybe we have a system whereby people are working from home a lot of days and only going in occasionally, if people are going back into office space, so we need to lay those environments out in such a way that as people start to go back into them, they are developing habits that are easy to keep up, that are not really effortful, that are not really irritating, that are things that we can get ingrained into their behaviour so they can think about their job and think about the things they need to do and not have to worry about all the behaviours to reduce infection all the time because that's what's intolerable. One of the things that's so psychologically difficult is having to worry about this upsetting thing that could happen to you at any time. Um, so you've got to try and design the environment so that habitually you 
you can after that so you can concentrate on what you need to. Now, that is a very high level answer to your question. What's difficult with this is that at the more practical, lower level, that means that we've got to get information into workplaces for how do you design your workplace to look better like this? How do you design it so it's easier for workers? How can you change the way you manage organizations so that you can have more people at home and be operating with fewer people in the office? And how can we make sure when they're in the office they can behave in a way that reduces infection without disrupting their work or without causing arguments between staff? How can we keep the team spirit there? where they've got to not only worry about output, but they've also got to worry about not spreading infection amongst each other. And those are big questions. But there, there's questions where behavioural science can be extremely helpful. In Ireland here, we're currently surveying small and medium enterprises to try and get some answers to what they will find most difficult. We're trying to get a package out to the behavioural science suggestions for how you might organise your business to help people have good habits to reduce infection so you can carry on your business. So those are the kind of things we're going to have to do. So looking even further on, at the end of this pandemic, what do you think are the lessons that we will have learned from COVID-19? And given a chance to start all over, early, for example, in early March, um, armed with what you know, is there anything that you would do differently? <laughs> there are enough lessons to be learned from this pandemic. There are books on it and people will. Um, but I think there are some things that we should really not forget. Um, I mean, one thing that strikes me um, as an economist as in a way crazy is that there was ever a short of this personal protective equipment, PPE. Uh, this stuff is really cheap and it lasts forever. So why have we not got... It's so so it, it's such a small public investment. Why have we not got warehouses full of it so that if there's ever a pandemic like this, we don't run out of it? Um, it would seem to me that you can stockpile and store it in such a way that we would never have that problem again. So there are simple economic lessons that I think we can learn. We can also learn lessons about these collective action problems. Uh, we can learn to trust each other a bit more. We can learn to have a greater belief in what society is capable of if it all acts as one and pulls together. And I think that's really interesting because we know from crises of different sorts in history, uh, particularly wartime, that experiences like this can actually have long-term effects on people's values, that it can make people more communitarian and it can make them believe that collective responses um, are perhaps more valid policy options than you might think, that trusting your fellow citizens to come together to solve problems can actually sometimes really be effective. So I think that's a very interesting uh, thing that I wouldn't want people to forget. Um, in terms of if we went back to the start of March, um, what would I do again or what might I do differently? Um, I think we have made a mistake uh, in getting too late onto the fact that the media would focus so much on non-compliance. Uh, this is a real problem because it reduces compliance. The more we talk about non-compliance, the more other people are less inclined to comply. So one thing I haven't said in these collective action problems that is important, and I should have said already, is that a lot of people are what are called conditional cooperators, which is they will go along with doing what is best for society. They'll make sacrifices to do what's best for the common good but only provided they see that that's what everyone else is doing. And if the focus is always on the small amount of non-compliance, what that means is some of those people stop complying too, because they say, well, look, if other people aren't going to do this, why should I? And that's conditional cooperation. I think we didn't see, and by we, what I really mean here is uh, kind of the, the science and policymaking community perhaps didn't see the problem that the media focusing on non-compliance and the visibility of non-compliance would cause. And I think if we got onto that quicker, we might have found solutions to it a little bit more quickly too. So one last question from me, and this is going to take a slightly different turn. Um, if you had all the funding in the world that you wanted to investigate one topic, what would that be? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask for a clarification, if that's okay. I sure. mean, are you saying all, all the money in the world, but I also have the best scientists in the world, or are you saying all the money in the world, but what would I do as a behavioural scientist? It can be both. <laughs> well, you want to give me two impossible questions. <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, then, look, it, it goes without saying, I mean, what we desperately need here is a vaccine and a treatment. I mean, that's what we need above all else. Uh, you know, and so actually, if I had lots and lots of money, I wouldn't be giving it to behavioral scientists. Some of my colleagues would kill me for this. But, you know, I mean, I wouldn't. I'd be giving it to the best teams in the world devising antiviral treatments and a vaccine. And I think that's what I would be trying to do. Um, from a behavioral science point of view, uh, I would argue that it is possible to run really insightful and effective online studies at the moment because people are in their houses and they're willing to do them. And if you had enough money, you could get really large sample, high quality data. And at the moment, we're managing to turn these studies around. Most of our samples are about five to 800, uh, which is decent enough, but we're not interested in uh, publishing. Well, we are interested in publishing psychology. But that's not the primary problem here. The primary problem here is that we need insights for policy. And if there's lots of money, and we could get large online panels who are willing to do experiments for us and willing to do studies for us because we're at a time of crisis and they're trapped in their homes. I would be throwing money at that because I think you can get really, really good insight from it. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.